So today, we are going to do the State of the Church Address. We're going to look at where we are, where the church is, what's the state of the church, where is church in America going? And so I just want to start by saying this, I have been the lead pastor of Family Church for almost four years, a little over three years, almost four years, but I've been on staff here for over 26 years. Now, we weren't always in this building. Uh, we were downtown Middletown. I started out as a housekeeper uh, as a teenager and became the maintenance man and then did all the technology and all those things. I became the youth pastor and I, I led worship in teens as I was youth pastor and then I was my dad's associate pastor and then voila, when he wanted to retire, I became the pastor of the church. Never in the history of the American church has it gone through what we have gone through in the last year. Never has the church in America been shut down, forced to close its doors for any sort of reason um, across the board. We're seeing churches today not only had to close their doors during the pandemic, but many churches had to close their doors indefinitely because they could not fund their ministry any longer. So I want to start by telling you what have we been doing? What's been going on here at Family Church? In the beginning of the, uh, of the year, end of 2019 into 2020, I kind of really felt this urge to uh, make some changes. So we changed our database, we changed our online giving, and we started purchasing um, equipment to do online streaming in a very different way. And so it's just, it was just brilliant that we as a team made those decisions because it made transitioning to online church seamless uh, when that happened. We've actually been streaming our services online since 2008, believe it or not. Uh, we were doing it way, way, way back in the beginning when it really wasn't a thing that was being done. But I, I, did, I did make some changes during the pandemic. We were broadcasting every night at 7 p.m. We were doing a nightly news. And it was me and a couple other staff. We would come in after our full work day. We'd come in at night and we'd, you know, do this broadcast. And man, it was tiring. Like after like a month and a half of that, we ran out of material. We didn't know what else to do. So we'd started just like playing games online just to make it fun and exciting and interactive with, with the church audience. And in the middle of that, I just got this idea. I was like, let's sell all of our video equipment and let's just buy all brand new 5K or 4K uh, video equipment. And so we did. And, and looking back in hindsight, it probably wasn't the time to spend money to buy cameras. That probably was not wise. When we were shut down, why would I go buy camera equipment? But we did. We sold all of our stuff. Uh, we, we made a good amount of money and we went and we bought all brand new 4K state-of-the-art uh, video equipment. And, and the team was kind of looking at me like, why did you do that? And I was like, I don't know. I have no idea why I did that. It was probably stupid. Several months ago, we got a phone call. And I haven't told, you, I haven't told anybody this. We got a phone call a few months ago. And a, um, a very popular Christian musician called us and said, I'm in the area until the new year. Could I come in and use your equipment to videotape me singing that I could do virtual worship services at other churches. So several months ago, 16 time Grammy nominee, six time Grammy award winning Israel Houghton has been coming to our church recording for other churches and recording uh, stuff that he was producing. Who is this guy if you don't know? Uh, he ended up marrying Adrian Ballone Houghton who was a cheetah girl. So they're pretty, pretty popular in the church world. I mean, I grew up on this guy's music. He's only a few years older than me. But he's been coming here every week, recording, and uh, we've, been, we've been producing it in-house and sending it out. So just a little, just a little. We, we recorded, check this one out. You're gonna like this one. We recorded uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes' Thanksgiving worship service here at the Potter's house that we record on the stage and being sent out. I mean, that's just pretty cool. And we recorded, we just recorded last week, a set for Elevation Church. So just saying, just saying, it's been pretty cool 
Um, we're not really like the name dropper type, so that's why we haven't said anything. But because we were working so hard through, through uh, the, the beginning of the pandemic, and we've been really working hard producing a lot of extra stuff behind the scenes, we've decided that from Christmas Day to January 3rd, we're going to have a staff vacation, staff break. We're all just going to take off. So what that means is this. December 27th, I have a treat for you. December 27th is the last Sunday of the year, and I would never close the doors without giving you a blessing. And here's the blessing. Mr. Israel owes me big time for everything that we've been producing. So he is going to come over my house with his wife, and we are going to record a Christmas song worship set with me preaching that will be a virtual online experience for December 27th. Is that all right? Now you may be saying, but well, why don't you have him come here live? And logistically, we would pack the place out. We couldn't social distance. It wouldn't be the safest way to do it if we announced that he was coming, which he has offered to come and lead worship on a Sunday, just to let you know, he, he has. Um, but that's what we're doing. I just want to let you know, for the 27th, it will be an online uh, worship experience, and we are really, really excited. Our band is going to be able to play with him and record it in the whole nine, all right? So moving forward, what do I see? And this, this part of it is going to be one of those things that's not, not really prophetic, but I want to let you know that I may be seeing some things that I'm not hearing the church world talk about. I'm hearing a lot of people say, I can't wait for things to get back to normal. It's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. What we knew as normal is not gonna happen again. And, and again, well, where's your faith? I'll get there, I'll get to my faith. But just a few years ago, a few, just a few months ago, if you'd have gone down to the Woodbury Commons and saw someone wearing a mask, you'd have laughed at them. you said, what's, what's up with this person wearing a mask in the shopping place? And now we're all wearing them everywhere we go, when we go. So to think that normal, what was normal a year ago is magically going to happen, it's not. Just let me point some things out. Uh, Supreme Court ruling just, just decided that New York State can no longer shut down churches. Can that, churches cannot be shut down. So the people who are choosing not to attend church today is not because they're not allowed. It's because they've made the choice. They made the choice. So what am I seeing? I'm seeing what has happened, what happened to the church in the book of Acts, chapter 8, verse 1. Let me explain this to you as we read it. It says this, Now Saul was consenting to his death. This is the Saul who would later become Paul, who would write three quarters of the New Testament. Saul was an enforcer of the law, and he was consenting to Stephen's death. Stephen being one of the followers of the way. Saul is consenting to Stephen's death. At the time, a great persecution rose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Watch. And they were all scattered. That's what I want to look at. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And I'm going to tell you what I see, is it seems to me as if the church is experiencing what Acts 8 verse 1 experienced, were scattered. We're scattered. I get uh, updates from other pastors who th they'll text me back, dude, I'm having to shut down. We had a positive case. So they're open and then they're closed and they're open and they're closed and people are watching or people are coming. And, and, and it's like we're scattered. And I think that the church universal is two things right now. They're scattered and divided. Divided as to what we believe about COVID. One side is, it's fake. This is a scam. On the other side, you better wear your mask all the time or you're, you know, killing everybody. And it's one or the other. There's almost like no balance. We're divided politically. It's either all the way over here or all the way over here. And if you like one or the other, well, I hate you. Scattered and divided. And that's what, church, that's what Acts 8 church was experiencing. Now I gotta tell you something, guys. This isn't new to God. 
This ain't new to God. He'd been through this already. He'd been through this already. He'd been through a shutdown. He'd been through a scatter. He's been through divided. He's been through it. But we haven't. So that's what our struggle is. How do I respond to something that I've never been through before? Well, we can learn from the Acts 8 church. What did Acts 8 do that we are not doing right now? Ready? Acts 8 verse 4. Therefore, because they were scattered, because their churches were shut down, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Now, they practiced social distancing and had their masks on, but they went everywhere preaching the word. They were sharing their faith with people around them. Okay, maybe you can't make it to church, but you can make it next door. You can be a light at your job. You can be a source of life to the hurting. Okay, come on, somebody. I'm, I'm just preaching the Bible here. This ain't, this ain't even the revelation yet. This is just Bible. And this is the part that's not happening. This is the part that's not happening. We're not preaching the gospel ever. We're not being a light. We're complaining as much as the world is. God's still doing his part. But we got to be doing our part by being light and salt. Light and salt. Light of the world, salt to the world. But I want to share something that I do know. And you're not going to hear another pastor say what I'm about to say because this is pastoral suicide. All right, you ready? What I know is this. I enjoyed watching myself preach on Sunday in my fuzzy pajamas in my backyard this summer. We recorded on Thursdays. We edited it, made sure that it was great, high quality. And on Sunday morning, I got to wake up just on time. I went outside, got some vitamin D from the sun. I was in the chat room chatting with people. I kind of liked it. I kind of liked it. And I'm seeing people across the board saying, I kind of like it too. I don't have to fight my kids to get them up in the morning to get dressed to make it to church online. I'm not having to fight with my spouse to get in the car to get to church on time. Come on, I'm just, I'm being honest. And what happens is we're even more divided because, and then don't take this the wrong way, people who are coming out to church think they're right and the people who are sitting at home are wrong. And the people who are sitting at home think you're wrong for coming out and putting everybody in danger. And I get it. I, I get it. I'm not standing up here foolishly thinking that I'm going to preach a sermon and, and everyone's flooding back to church. Can we use the freedoms and liberties in Jesus Christ to spread the gospel and be a light wherever we are? But let's talk about this. Let's talk about why there's even a greater divide. Why right now pastors are beating up the people who are in the room for the sake of people watching online, right? I mean, I've been guilty of doing that. Beating up who's in the room because of who's watching online and making people feel bad because they're enjoying watching church online. What, what biblical premise, what scripture do churches use to make people feel bad about it? Because it's in the Bible. Let's talk about it today. Let's talk about it today. Hebrews 10.24. As I told you, nobody's going to preach this. Nobody's going to preach this. But I'm being honest. I'm shooting from the hip today. Hebrews 10.24 says this. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Now we all know that this is what we need to be doing. We need to be stirring up love and we need to be doing good works. That, that's the life of the Christian, showing our fruit, being fruitful. Forsaking not, or not forsaking, the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as the day approaches. Right? So listen, if you're not coming to church, you're violating the scripture, get to church. All right. Now, I believe in theology. 
I believe we need to understand what we just read. Can someone tell me today who wrote the book of Hebrews? Anybody? We don't know. Nobody knows. There's no author. We don't know. The Bible doesn't know. <laughs> uh, it could be Paul. It could be Barnabas. It could have been uh, a letter to Timothy. We, we don't really know. Um, Paul could have been the author behind it. Someone else could have penned it. But nobody took ownership of it. It doesn't say, I, Paul, am writing to you. So really, any Bible you look at, it's assumed that it's one of those people in Paul's time. It was written before A.D. 70. It was written before A.D. 70. Guess what they did not have in A.D. 70? Churches. So even for a pastor to get up and say, if you're not coming to church, you're violating this, he doesn't even know theology because there wasn't even churches. There was in-home gatherings. They met at homes. And they did Bible studies in homes. And it says, so for not, forsake not getting together with other believers and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we are progressively applying that to the church world. But to say that someone's not doing that because they didn't show up on a Sunday, you can't say that. Let's look at some things. In AD 70, they had no concept of the computer. In AD 70, they had no foresight that there would be the internet. In AD 70, they, never, they had no inkling that there would be something called live streaming services where people could watch what you're saying across the world live from one location. Now, it was, how would you know that? They didn't know that. I promise you today that if Paul was alive, he would have a bigger streaming online audience than Stephen Furtick at Elevation Church. He would use whatever means to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to the four corners of the earth. My message today is this. We've got to stop the divide. We've got to stop the, the, the condemnation. We gotta stop the conviction that you're right because you're here and someone's wrong because they're home or you're right because you're home and they're wrong because they're putting people in jeopardy. We gotta stop that. We will remain scattered and we will remain divided over scriptures that we're misinterpreting. What is God calling you to do? Pastor Mike, are you telling us that it is okay for us to not come back to church? I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Come back to church. Meet with believers. But don't sit home convicted and let anybody make you feel bad because that's the choice that you're making. Honor God with your lifestyle. And you hear from the Holy Spirit as to what that means for you. If you're enjoying church online, then how about you share that with a neighbor? How about you invite a family member over who doesn't know Jesus and say, hey, I know that you're not really a church person, but you gotta watch what my pastor said on Sunday. And put it on on your TV or on your phone and let somebody see it. And what is that doing? That is preaching the gospel to the world, even in the midst of being scattered. Host watch parties. What I see is people hosting watch parties at their homes that eventually, through their own personal leadership, will become church campuses. And then we begin to have church campuses in other cities, in other towns, in other states, because people did what the Word of God said. They hosted the gospel in their home. I do see a day that in-person attendance will rise, but I think it's going to be a while. I think it's going to be a while. So I'm going to be honest and transparent, and I haven't heard anybody say, any, any other pastor say what I'm about to say either, Okay? Here's the facts. Attendance is low. Online attendance is low. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were seeing three, 4,000 online viewers. Now around 1,500, 1,600 on a weekend is really good. Big, big difference, big shift. Finances are low. You go from a church of 2,500 to we will throw a pizza party on Monday if we hit 500 on a weekend. So going from doing church at 2,500 to a church of not even 500 is shocking. Preaching, 
preaching in front of 150, 160 people when we were used to 700, 800 in the room? It's shocking. It's different. So how does that make you feel, Pastor Mike? How does that make you feel? It makes me feel completely inadequate. I feel inadequate for this. I feel underprepared. I feel way out of my league faith-wise. When I look at the faith giants that came before me and they could stand in their pulpits and they could just preach the faith, the faith, the faith, I don't feel that at this exact second. And I'm not saying that I don't have faith. And I'm not saying I'm not a man of faith. And I'm saying that I don't pray. But I'm just saying, I don't see what I hear everybody else saying they see. That 2021 is going to come and it's going to be blown away and everything's going to be back to normal. I don't see that. I don't see that. And I've been very frustrated. And I had to go to God and I'm going to call it prayer, but it was really aggravation. I said, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do right now. And I'm gonna talk to somebody in the room who's been through something lately and you didn't know what to do. I don't know what decision to make. I don't know how to make my business grow. I don't know how to make my business better. I don't know how to get more customers. Well, what, do, what do I do? So I went to the Lord a few weeks ago out of frustration. And I said, Lord, I don't wanna be, I don't wanna lack faith. And I don't wanna be carnal. I don't want to lean to my own understanding. I want to walk in all your ways. I want to acknowledge you and let you direct my path. And so I went back and I looked at the story of Moses. Moses is, is told, instructed by God to break free the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery, out of bondage, into a free land. And so he does. He goes in, breaks them out, they leave, and all of a sudden, you know, the armies are after them, they part the Red Sea, they go across on dry land, blah, 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 and then Moses looks back, he's like, all right, God, I got them here, now what? I did it, but now I've got millions of people who need food. How do I feed them? I got millions of people who need water. How do I get them that to drink? And I love what God said to him. And I think that's kind of what felt in my spirit. He said, Moses, what's in your hand? So I kind of took that to me. Mike, what's in your hand? And in that moment, it was a cup of coffee, but I know that's not what he's talking about. <laughs> what do you have to work with? What do you have in your life to work with? What experience do you have in your life that God can use now? What did God put in you from the time that you were a child to the time of now that God can work with? And now, you gotta understand something about me. I've always fixed things. From like seven, eight years old, people would bring me clocks and blenders and microwaves that were broken, and I would take them apart. <laughs> fix them, put them back together, and they would work. And someone would say, well, what was it? Ah, I cleaned it and put it back together and it worked. I, I didn't know. But it, everything that these hands touched, I fixed them. It worked. And I felt God say to me, what's in your hand? And as I looked around, I said, well, I've got 65,000 square feet of building that sits all week. We use it on Sundays. Nothing else really is happening in 65,000 square feet of building. What could we do to advance the kingdom and make money? So, I'd like to announce that tentatively, March 2021, we will be opening Little Sprouts Daycare here at Family Church in our children's ministry building. Amen? <laughs> Little Sprouts Daycare. It is something we can do. It's something that we have. The building is here. Uh, the classrooms are perfectly set up for it. Uh, we desire to offer competitive prices, a clean and safe and fun environment for childcare so that for, for the kids of our church and the people of our community so that parents can go to work with knowing that their kids are cared for in a great, great way. It, it's not going to technically be like a Christian daycare. We're not doing Bible lessons, but we are going to be Christians who are running it, so your kids will be in 
surrounded by good, wholesome people. All right? Little sprout steak here. The second thing that we want to do, because again, what can I do? What's in my hands? What do I have to work with? The second thing that we want to do is not only partner with, but also open our own counseling center. Counseling center. There is a huge need and demand for multiple levels of counseling and therapy and support. Amen? And we not only want to have male counselors, but female counselors, child uh, therapy and, and sensory therapy, all these sort of things that we would love to offer. Uh, and it would partner perfectly, not only with just helping people in general, but it, with our recovery programs as well. So we are looking to do that. Uh, so there's multiple sides to that. One will be employment opportunities, and two would also be care for our community and people that we know, that we can give them advice and therapy and sound counsel based upon God's word. Amen? Thirdly, thirdly, we are stepping into the real estate business. The real estate business. Now hear this out, okay? This is, this is a big one for me. Not only do we want to purchase um, homes and commercial properties, but we want to employ people who just need a chance, people who just need a shot, an open door. Whether it's somebody who was previously incarcerated, who's having a hard time getting a job, or someone who just got out of rehabilitation, some sort of rehab, we would love to employ them and give them a shot. Give them a chance. Let them come alongside us and do the demolition of homes and ripping out messed up kitchens and cleaning out basements and, 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 and work with somebody who is on them and watching their progress and keeping them in line, but also creating a way that they can make some finances so they can make wise decisions in their life moving forward. We also would like to do this uh, possibly uh, with, with automotive as well, partnering with or uh, starting our own uh, vehicle maintenances or things like that where we can partner with people and say, hey, there's just some people who just need a shot. They just need a chance. They can change tires. They can change brakes. The automotive, it takes some skill level you have to have. Um, pretty much anybody can pick up a sledgehammer and tear, tear sheet rock out. But there's twofold. We can employ people to work on the homes, but then we also get to flip the homes and sell them for reasonable prices, not trying to price gouge, but sell the houses for reasonable prices that fund the kingdom of God and keep things moving forward. Lastly, what's in my hand? I have 20 acres. We have, we have. We have 20 acres of unused property out back. And I was thinking, worst case, apoc apocalypse happens, right? When people talk about apocalypse. What would we do for food? I thought to myself, I mean, we got 20 acres out back that we can farm. We can farm. We want to start by putting small groups together, people who are interested in farming, and get out on that 20 acres and start tilling it, plant corn, plant vegetables, plant some fruits, so that we can produce our own fruits and vegetables that are available to our church body. So, so multiple sides to that as well. Come out. Get your exercise by doing some of the farming in the nice weather, but then also we will have food for ourselves that we could have a fruit stand or vegetable stand or make available in the lobby or whatever it is, and we can fund and keep things moving forward. We also have a pond out there that we're talking about stocking and, and, and growing our own fish. So listen, I know this is a lot, and you're looking at me like, what in the world are you thinking? I'm thinking what other pastors aren't daring to think. They're not daring to think that. They, they, they want to just do what's easy, stand on the stage and preach a sermon, and then something's going to happen. But I prayed over you every single week that everything you would set your hands to would prosper and be successful. So let me call out of you today, what is 
in your hands. What did God deposit into you when you were a child, when he called you out of the womb? What did God plant inside of you that he would one day need to call back out of you because he deposited to grow and be taken care of and nurtured for such a time as this? When he's saying, all right, I need that now. I need that deposit that I put in you. I need you to put your hands on the plow. I need you to make something out of that. I need you to work that gifting now to move the kingdom of God forward. Here's what I know. The miracle's in the house. The miracle's in this house. You're a miracle sent to this house for this very hour. There's somebody in here today that you've been saying it. I just need someone to give me a shot. I just need somebody to give me a chance. And I know I can do something with my life. All right, this is your season. This is your hour. This is your time. Now you have to walk, the Bible says, walk there in it. Walk there in it. Walk through open doors of opportunity. Here's what I know. You have to seize the opportunity of a lifetime in the lifetime of the opportunity. When someone calls it out of you, it resounds in your spirit. There's this tugging, there's this knowing, I was made for this. I was made for this. And I believe it with all my heart that God wants to use every single believer with what he had placed in them as a child. Whatever that is. You might be wise with finances and, and help somebody get their, get their affairs in order and get their accounts in order. I, I don't know what it is, but every single one of us has something that God put in us for this generation. My prayer today is that you would hear what I said with, with open ears. I, could stand, I stand before God today and I say, God, this is what I can do. This is what I can do. I can't make people come to the church because I'm such a good speaker. I can't do that. I can't, I can't put more Facebook ads out. But this I can do. I can use this building. I can use what you've entrusted me with. I can use the property that I have. I can use the pond that we have. I can, I can do this. And I believe that God says, yes, you can. And I will bless the works of your hands. Amen.